Okay, uh, my name is Morna Gerard, and I am interviewing Catherine Oxnard Ellis for Georgia State University's Women's March Oral History Project. The date is July 15th, 2017, and the interview is taking place at the Georgia Historical Society in Savannah, Georgia. Okay, let's start with a very easy question. What year were you born, and where were you born? I was born in 1964 uh, in Greenville, Mississippi, even okay. though both sides of my family are from Savannah. My parents were in Greenville. My dad was working for a pro-civil rights newspaper for Hotting Carter's newspaper in the Delta. And so they moved there right after Kennedy was assassinated. And, um, and so I, was born, I happened to be born there in, in January of 1964. Did they remember Kennedy being assassinated? Um, like, did, they, um, did they talk about that when you were uh, Yeah, absolutely. What, would, what were their feelings about it? Um, my mom's family were hardcore Democrats, Catholic. So uh, even though my mom has since not been, because she's moved away from the Catholic Church, um, it was a huge deal for them. They were huge Kennedy supporters. And my, my parents were in college at that time. He, he was a mythic figure to my parents. Um, so it, it was devastating. It was also, you know, an odd time. My dad had just graduated from college. My mom had left college because she was pregnant with me. Okay. So she was pregnant with me when all of this happened. Um, but in, in, in the midst, well, before that, um, Dad had graduated. They had driven south from, from Cambridge, from Harvard, with my mom pregnant. Uh, he'd finished in the summertime, and they stopped to hear Martin Luther King give his I Have a Dream speech with me in utero. Yeah, at the, um, at the, you know, the March on Washington. So it was... They were a little bit older than than baby boomers. They're just slightly older than that, but I, you know, they're the leading edge of that wave, and they were really affected by um, Kennedy's candidacy, uh, by the civil rights movement. My dad had already been involved in the civil rights movement a little bit here in Savannah, and, and some sit-ins, which were mostly related to, uh, they weren't they weren't the. I think there were some, you know, lunch counter things here, but mostly it was about the ports and the longshoremen. Um, anyway, so my dad had been involved in that, and he really wanted to uh, be involved in that. And this is a long way, long backstory, but um, I'm actually working on a documentary about all of this. But um, he uh, heard Hotting Carter Jr. give a talk at Harvard uh, on a panel with other Southern white editors who were, if not pro-civil rights, they were, um, they were definitely not, they were not, um, you know, the White Citizens Council in Mississippi, they were not, they, they were progressive. And my dad was really impressed with them, and he wrote to Hodding Jr. and said, I'd, I'd love to work with you, and Hodding Jr. then had become sick, and his son wrote back and said, we'd love to have you on the paper in Mississippi, we can't pay you much. And Dad went for an interview, he got the job, and then he brought my mom um, via the I Have a Dream speech. Um, so anyway, they, they had been very, very involved in all of that. My mom helped register voters, um, African-American voters, with SNCC in Mississippi during Freedom Summer. Uh, Freedom Summer was the first summer that we were there. That was also the summer that the three civil rights workers were murdered just a hundred some odd miles away. So. You know, this is my this is my background. My, I come from a long line of Southern progressives. I think many Americans have no idea that this tradition exists, which is very frustrating for me. And part of the reason I'm working on a documentary about this, there's a long history of people trying to do the right thing, um, not just in the context of civil rights, but on, on many fronts, mm -hmm. in, including including women's rights, including suffrage. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm actually working on a novel that involves women's the women's suffrage movement in Louisiana and Savannah. So that's my background. I'm a writer. I'm a you know I'm a, I'm a storyteller, and and I've been a feminist since I was born <laughs> because of my mom. <laughs> So we had little women's liberation T-shirts when we were when we were tiny little ones running around. So you know it's just in my blood. Yeah. Did you have siblings? 
Yeah, I'm the eldest of um, four on my, it's complicated, because my parents have divorced and I have six parental units, but um, from my mom and my dad, uh, the ones who were the, the two I, I talked about earlier. Um, so my mom's name is Lucy Scardino, and she uh, was raised here in Savannah. Um, and my dad is Tom Oxnard, and he was born and raised in Savannah. Um, and his, his family is the Savannah Sugar Refinery, the Dixie Crystals family. Anyway, um, so they had three girls, boom, boom, boom. So my mom had three girls by the time she was 23 years old. And she raised you all to be feminists. And she raised us all to be feminists. Was your dad feminist? He wouldn't call himself that, uh, but he is a, a staunch Yellow Dog Democrat. In fact, he won the Yellow Dog Democrat Award at the Buttermer Dinner here um, and the Chatham County Democratic Dinner um, three, four years ago. So both staunch Democrats, both very, very progressive, both, both um, very artistic and creative people. My dad was a journalist for a while and a poet and an actor. My mom was a designer and an artist. Um, and uh, so, so I was the first, and then um, 17 months later came my sister Robbie. Um, her name is Robbie Oxnard Bent. And then 19 months after her came my sister Liza, who is Liza Oxnard Arito. And uh, we definitely were raised to be fe strong feminists with you know, a real focus on education and empowerment and can do anything we want to do and we were little tomboys and we ran around and played in the dirt and rode horses and you know were rough and tumble that was our childhood at what point did you come down to savannah so i was born in mississippi we were there for a couple of years shy of a couple of years we moved back to georgia and then we came here to savannah my sister robbie was born but then we moved back to atlanta we moved up to atlanta because my dad wanted to start his own civil rights paper there. So he bought a small paper there and he was running that and we were there for several years and my sister Liza was born in Atlanta and then they divorced and my mom brought us back to Savannah. So we came back in 67. My mom is a single mom with three daughters and we lived on Gaston Street. We lived on 20 West Gaston Street. Literally, I could throw a stone at it right now. That's great. Yeah. You have good memories of growing up in Savannah? Incredible memories, yeah. We lived downtown. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was a really interesting time, this, the late 60s in Savannah. Um, Savannah integrated pretty peacefully, from what I hear. I, I don't remember uh, a lot of tension or problems. And we, as far as I know, we were one of the few white families on this stretch of Gaston. I mean, there, there was maybe one or two others, but not many. And, you know, we, Forsyth Park was our, was our yard. And so, you know, we were playing with kids, you know, white and black, mostly black. And, and we, it felt to be, a, at, at that time, I mean, I was a tiny kid, but I, it felt very peaceful to me. Um, I don't, I don't remember issues and, and problems and, um, you know, maybe that's rose colored glasses, but it felt, it felt, it was a wonderful place to be a kid. Yeah. I can imagine just like being around here. This, this is, this is your backyard. This is my backyard. Pretty, pretty wonderful. <laughs> yeah. And um, what was the name of the newspaper that your father, um, established in Atlanta? Oh gosh, I'll have to ask. Um, the one he worked for in Mississippi is the Delta Democrat Times uh, that was owned and run by Harding Carter III after his dad was too ill and infirm to, to keep going with it. Um, it's still around. It's, it's, they've long since sold, sold the paper of that family. The paper my dad, I can't remember. I'll have to find out the name of, of that paper. It, I think he bought a shopper, you know, sort of, it would be like buying... Um, the penny saver or something, you know, that he was then turning into a weekly rabble-rousing, muckraking, you know, pro-civil rights paper in Atlanta. Um, and he ran that for several years, I know, before he decided that he was going to move away from journalism and he ended up doing totally other things. But um, I don't remember the name of the paper. Okay. Yeah. Don't worry about that. Um, so you're a writer. Can yes. you talk about the kinds of things that you write? Sure. Um, I have been a professional writer for 30, 30 years, really, really on and off since I, since I graduated from college. And 
um, working for nonprofits as a writer, working as a as a as a copywriter in uh, for advertising agencies in New York, working on staff at magazines in New York and in Colorado, and then as a freelancer. So I started out doing those those things. I mean, my undergraduate degree is in journalism and Italian studies. Um, but that was just, you know, I sort of created my own major. So and where, where did you go to school? I went to Brown University. Oh. Um, and I, so I, I, I've been writing really my whole adult life in some capacity or another. And I really didn't think I wanted to write fiction. I, 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 I was terrified of that. I, I really have no interest in doing that. I took one class in fiction writing and I just, felt way over my head. I, I had no idea what I was doing and I thought, well, I'm going to go and write for magazines or some other capacity and then I did eventually. And that was great fun. It was a great apprenticeship, you know. Um, and then I actually was working on staff and a, and a colleague said, and I was actually thinking about going to law school and I was applying, and a colleague said, I don't think you need to go to law school. I think that you should get an MFA. And I said, what's an MFA? I had no idea. I mean, I was so clueless about fiction, um, other than just reading it and loving it. So I found out what an MFA program was, and then I started applying to MFA programs, and then I, I ended up at NYU, which was really wonderful, and I, again, had an incredible apprenticeship through that, that it probably would have taken me 10 or 15 years to learn the craft of writing fiction if I tried to do it on my own, and, and so I was really lucky. And, and so I started writing fiction, I came out with a, with a collection, but I didn't, I really didn't have any interest in getting an agent or, I just wanted to keep writing. I wasn't ready to kind of go hard at publishing yet. But I published stories here and there, traveled around, lived in Italy for a while, did a bunch of stuff. Um, and then, you know, finally wrote a novel, got an agent, agent tried to sell it, didn't work out, unfortunately. Um, got another agent, that didn't work out either. And all the while I just kept writing and writing essays. I started writing essays. I started writing op-eds for the Savannah Morning News about everything from politics to nature to family stories, everything. And I finally came back to fiction about a year ago. I was in a writing group and I was working on this documentary. I was working on the treatment with my writing group, her amazing group of women. And I, I just thought, you know, I've got this group and I think I should write fiction again. So I started writing a novel um, that is, I don't want to talk too much about it, but it's set partly here and partly in New Orleans from the 1890s until the 1960s. Awesome. And so it deals with gender issues and race and class and the frictions that, you know, it, in, in that soup of things. So, yeah. Um. Are, could you have family? Are you married with kids? I'm married. I got married seven years ago, so kind of late in life. Um, and my wonderful husband, his name is Blake Ellis, and um, he brought with him two fabulous kids. So I'm a stepmom, which is an incredible joy for me. Uh, I know a lot of stepmoms have a really tough, tough time, and that's never been the case for me. It, it, they just have been, you know, our struggles as, fa as a family, but um, I bonded with them immediately. They were little, they were five and seven when I met them, so we had an incredible bonding time. And I love them and worship, worship at their altar, and I'm really, really lucky. So I kind of, you know, I'd wanted a family and it wasn't happening, and then all of a sudden, boom, I had an Insta family. <laughs> Overnight family. <laughs> so, um, I will ask this question, it's probably pretty clear. What political party do you support? I support the Democrats. In the past, um, you know, I've joked that I'm to the left of Che Guevara. I, I, I've, I've been, a, you know, really in sync with the Green Party, but certainly not this time. Not this time. Um, and I'm pretty disappointed, actually, with the way the Green Party has gone nationally. Locally, I think there's some great stuff. When I lived in Maine, I lived in Maine for a while, and the Green Party's pretty active there and has members in the State House and the State Senate. And um, if I lived in a place like Maine or California or something like that, I might consider being more involved with the with the Green Party or with the International Green Party, really. I'm more, more interested, actually, in what they're doing in Germany and other places. But no, not, 
no, it was pretty, it was pretty pathetic, the candidate they put up this, this time. I, I felt, you know, anyone who's an anti-vaccination person is, yeah. I have a major problem with. Yeah. Uh, being the granddaughter and niece and cousin of doctors and, and great granddaughter of, of doctors. Um, who founded medical schools and and, and, and hospitals? Like, yeah. <laughs> I just can't. I can't go that way. Um, so I'm a, I'm a strong Democrat. Um, I very much supported Hillary, but I was I was really interested in Bernie. Um, I think I think Bernie is you know is a really sharp guy and was speaking a lot of truth to power. So I was very excited about Bernie and voted for him in the primary. Mm-hmm. But I'm not an idiot, and even though I've I wasn't a really huge fan of the Clintons ever because I'm I'm to the left of the Clintons. You know, I was a Jerry Brown girl. I was a, you know, um, I'm not an idiot. And I want, you know, I really liked what Hillary said about I'm a progressive who likes to get things done. Yeah. You know, I'm an ideologue. I, I, I admit that. But I'm really, really practical. And part of the reason I like some of the platforms of, of the Democrats um, it's not just because they're compassionate and, you know, on, on the, you know, correct morally, in my opinion, but they work, yeah. you know? I mean, single payer, which is actually really, you know, more Bernie's thing than, than Hillary's, but she pushed it back in the 90s. They were, the Clintons were big proponents of that back in the 90s. Um, it's the only thing that's going to work. Nothing, we can keep piecemealing our way through healthcare reform, but we're going to end up with single payer, or we're going to end up with people dying on the streets. Those are really the two options. There really aren't any other options. So I, I consider myself a, a Democrat, not in the vein of my dad, who is a really old school yellow dog Democrat, but in the sense of somebody who says, this is what we've got and we're going to work with it. And um, we need to, we need to get you know, more people excited about the party. We need to get more young people involved in the party. We certainly need to get more women engaged at every level. Um, but I consider myself a Democrat. Okay. Now, in the past, have you um, been active politically? Have you protested? Yeah. Could you talk about what you've, you've yeah. done before? Um, I've been involved in, in a whole lot of protests from the local level to the national level. And I've even walked in some international marches. Um, I'm trying to remember the very first time I marched, but it was probably, it was pro- uh, it might have been as a kid. Um, I don't, I don't have any very specific memories, but my parents, well, obviously in utero at the, at the March on Washington in 1963, but um, there might have been some stuff that we did um, when I was a kid. Maybe we lived in Cincinnati for a little while. There might have been some stuff about the environment there, and I'm not remembering that clearly. But I know that by the time I got to Brown, I was really, oh, I well, I, this wasn't really a rally, but I was in high school in Washington um, when, when Reagan was inaugurated, and we went to the inauguration, which was really wild. And seeing all this stuff about the pictures of the inauguration this year was really wild for me because we, we were just high school students, and and the, you know, I was at a boarding school. I was at day student. I was at a boarding school, and the but we went out, and the buses took us there, and we went, and there was hardly anybody on the mall. It was very cold. Um, it was not a very well attended inauguration. That I, as I, I mean, we were right up to the Capitol. I mean, it was not that hard. Um, so that was really interesting. I don't think we were carrying any signs or anything. Um, I was also involved. Uh, there was someone from who'd been an alumna of our high school who was a hostage um, in the Iran hostage crisis. And when she came back, we went to the motorcade, you know, along the streets of the motorcade and brought signs welcoming her back. And then a few years after that, when I was in, in college, I started, you know, going to protests at Brown against the CIA and against apartheid and everything you can imagine. I was Brown. Um, and then I went to to, uh, one march, one pro-choice march in during my college years, I'm pretty sure, in Washington, on the Mall, and then another one in the 90s, which was huge. And we felt at that time that there were, you know, 750,000 plus people on the Mall. And the National Park Service estimated <coughs> that it was something like you know, half that amount. Of course. But it was huge. I mean, the, the mall was filled. Yeah. 
So I have been on at protests on the mall. I've been in um, uh, pro gay rights march. I've been in a pro gay rights march in London. I feel like I've just sort of happened upon things sometimes, and sometimes it's been intentional. But um, but yeah, I, I'm very much an activist and very involved in you know phone banks and phone calls and giving money and giving time and volunteering and making signs and my whole life I've done all of that. That's great. Are you passing that on to, to your kids now? Yes, and it really made me sad that I couldn't bring my stepdaughter. Um, she had SATs that day. So it, it just, it just, you know, it wasn't going to work. And also, you know, we would have had to clear that with her mom, and so it's a little complicated. But um, but according to her dad, who stayed home with the kids um, when I went up to Washington, when she got back from her SATs, she was glued to the news and asking huge numbers of questions and wanted and grilled me when I got back and was really, really engaged. Her, her mom is an environmental activist, um, so she's grown up with, with that. Um, but, you know, I think she was really just quite blown away by the sheer size of what she was seeing on the news. That's pretty wonderful, you know, for being a young, like some of young and impressionable, seeing a family member be involved in this, as in something that's just so, the magnitude of it is just so beyond what anyone ever expected. It's like, it, it could be like a, a really important pivotal moment in a young person's life to, to, sort of, to touch that. That's a, yeah, that's a, that's a good point actually. Um, she plays things close to the vest. She is not a really emotive person. And maybe because she grew up with her mom being an activist, you know, she sort of wanted to sort of find her, carve out her own space in life. And so I, I don't know that she's ready to call herself that or to engage on that level. But the way that my husband was describing her reaction and then knowing that her stepmom her two aunties, her step-grandmother. Also, my mom's second husband was there. We ended up seeing him as well. His wife, their daughter, uh, a cousin on that side and other relatives on that side. My stepfather's two female cousins were there. Um, on my biological dad's side, his wife went with her daughter. So I probably had just family members, I probably had 25 or 30 people or more. And in terms of people I actually knew from Savannah and from all over the country, and because people were texting me and Facebooking me and saying, are you going to be there? Maybe we can meet up. And, you know, that was just insane. There was no possible way. But, I mean, I personally probably know 300 people, if not 500 or 600 people, or more who went to the march and Jax knows that this is my stepdaughter she she knows that and you know she 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 realized that this was touching her even though she wasn't there yeah. and and I had said to her you know I'm I'm doing this not for me you know I'm you know I'm 53 now and I'm you know, so I don't know how much longer I'm going to live. Well, I could live another 53 years, or I could live, I don't know. I'm doing this for you and for your generation, but at some point, y'all are going to have to take this up. Mm. You know, and I can't believe that I'm having to do this again mm. about reproductive rights and, you know, the rights of, you know, immigrants and the rights of indigenous peoples. And, and, you know, for healthy air, water, and, and climate change. And I said, it's really astonishing to me that, that I'm, <laughs> this is the same fight. That, that I'm fighting the same battle that I fought and that my mom fought. So she, I think she was really, you know, woke, as they say now, as the kids say. <laughs> she, she was woke by that. And, and that was... That was good for me to see because like a lot of people, and I'm sure a lot of people who are doing these interviews, I was devastated by the election. I, I, I've lived in foreign countries. I've traveled you know, around the world a couple times. I grew up with a mom who was at times dirt poor and at times less so. Um, 
you know, I, I, I live a life of privilege, I'm white and I'm educated, um, but I'm also an artist who's spent many years where she made, you know, less than $20,000 a year. So I feel that I really understand a lot of different perspectives. And as a writer, I have to inhabit characters who are very different from me, different from me gender-wise or racially or ethnically or, you know, socioeconomically or um, in every possible way, you know. And, and even I... <laughs> I couldn't imagine myself into a space where the kinds of things that the candidate was saying were not disqualifying. It wasn't so much that I thought that everyone who voted for our current president was a racist, homophobic, Islamophobic, um, you know, idiot, but what what he said and what he did did not disqualify him. It, it did not close that door for them. And the level of not just angst and anxiety and fear, but a anger and pure hatred. I, and not just, you know, not just the Breitbart alt-right hatred. The, the hatred of people like me because I'm educated and I've had opportunities and again I cop to that privilege I cop to it mm -hmm. there's nothing I can do but cop to it mm -hmm. you know but I thought that was the American dream I thought that everybody wanted to have the opportunities that I've had and I want everyone to have those opportunities and so you know I felt that <laughs> naively I guess, that Hillary Clinton was offering that. And clearly that message did not come across. Or it came across with enough condescension, I guess, or perceived condescension that it, that it, that it angered people even more. And I, I think the way that I felt after the election was pa paralyzed and my heart was broken into a million pieces. I am one of those idiots who actually believes in my country. I actually love my country. I'm, I know that it's, a lot of people level this against the left, that, that we hate America. I've never, I love my country. Living abroad, traveling abroad, speaking other languages only made me feel more American, only made me love my country more. I mean, I knew living in Puerto Rico as a child. We lived there for a while which is technically part of the States, but obviously very, very different. Um, how profoundly fortunate we are to live someplace with so much opportunity and not so much dire poverty. Now I know, obviously we have a lot of horrible dire poverty here, but you know, coming from even the South in the 1970s and going to Puerto Rico, the poverty was pretty darn <laughs> shocking. So I was, I became a writer in that and during that time because I had to write to my family and friends because there was no internet and phone calls were crazy expensive. And I would write them I would write them about what I was seeing. So, you know, I felt more American living in Puerto Rico. I felt more American living in Italy when I lived in Italy. I felt more American when I was traveling in Southeast Asia. I I love my country. I want it to become a more perfect union. I really, really do. I'm, I'm kind of an idiot that way. So. Well, we're all idiots together, I guess. Yeah. Uh, it's very interesting talking about you know education and how important you think that is, and we all expect that that is a very important part of, of living the American dream. Within the last couple of weeks, there was a report stating that conservatives actually think a lot of education is bad for the country. And we're this is a strange place that we're sitting, like you know, to, to for for that. For that to be the case, yeah. uh, it's it's just an astonishing place to be, you know. Yeah, I, I look. I I I saw some of the stuff that I think has really become quite toxic now. I saw it at Brown in the in the nineteen eighties. That you know the the intolerance for various viewpoints and the you know I, I do get why um, some on the right call liberals snowflakes and 
you know, if we can't tolerate multiple points of view, we have no business being in a university setting. Um, that's just, it's just crazy. It's crazy town. Um, so I get that, but we should all want more information all of the time. The, the, rejecting information, rejecting the pursuit of information, rejecting the desire for information and truth, whatever that may be, wherever that may lie, as a writer and artist and a thinking sentient being, I, I that is terrifying to me. Uh, no matter where it comes from, you know, I remember reading The Unbearable Lightness of Being and and reading um, other Milan Kundera stuff and Tressel Milos and all of, all of those Eastern European writers and 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 seeing some of the plays that came out of that out of that time um, and and being really shocked because I had grown up under Nixon and Ford with a brief little foray into Carter and and Reagan and Bush and so. <laughs> You know, it was like, wow, there's a tyranny of the left because I feel like I've only seen the tyranny of the right. You know, and I, and I really, how interesting that was. But that was really telling to me. Okay, and then I thought, well, I, I'll never be a communist then because, no, I'm, I have no interest in, in that. I have no interest in filtering everything, everything through the lens of something that doesn't allow you to see things as they are clearly. And so I... Yeah, I, I, I'm really, I'm stunned by this idea that education is dangerous. That, that's Orwellian to me. That's, that's Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, which our step, my stepson is reading right now and really liking. And, and you know, I'm, I'm waiting till he's done to talk to him about the parallels to today and Dixie, Dixie Chick's albums being burned in Nashville. And so, you know, I, I'm, I guess... So for me, the, the march, when, the, when I heard about the march, I began talking about it with my mom. And, you know, my mom and I were talking about it, and I was, I was, I was crying. I, was, I cried for weeks and weeks and weeks after the election and talked to my family. I couldn't really talk to anybody else. I couldn't really, I couldn't really deal with the public at all. Um, I, I, I felt a lot of paranoia. I felt a lot of fear. Um, I felt fear for my gay friends. Uh, I felt fear for my friends of color. Um, I felt like I could, you know, I could slip or slip around unnoticed because people couldn't couldn't read Democrat on my arm. Um, but I was really I was terrified for for my friends. Um, it's not a good position when you feel like you have to slip around unnoticed. Yeah, that's n exactly, and it was exactly exactly. <laughs> um, so I began to talk with mom as soon as I heard about the march. Um, you know, it wasn't clear whether it was really going to be a going concern at first. I wasn't really sure it was really going to happen. It seemed a bit chaotic and, and you know, as a lot of things are for us progressives. But I began to talk to mom about it and my mom took it and ran with it. My 74 year, so 73 year old mom with Crohn's disease, who is, you know, really bedridden a lot of the time, said, oh, we're going. We're, we're going. And Robbie and Liza were coming too. So we're doing this. And I said, well, you know, people are talking about buses. She said, nope. She said, uh, I, I already went online and bought a ticket and here's the link and you need to buy your ticket. And I'm going to get Robbie and Liza to buy tickets and I'm going to find this housing. And she, we, she lived in DC for a while. So she began to call her friends and she found an old, the, the widower of an old friend of hers who um, absolutely agreed to take us in and, and his son did as well. And so it was arranged, I mean, at the, within, I don't know, days, maybe a week or two of the march being announced, boom, done. Because I was thinking that I would hop on the bus, as my, my stepmom did here with her daughter. She went on the bus with the, the bunch of Savannah women who, who went, which was, sounds like it was a blast. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I was just figuring, oh, well... We'll drive, we'll do, no, we're going and we have to get it organized. And my mom just made it happen. She's made it happen. Um, and she said, she said, I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm allowed to use profanity can, in this. You can say okay. whatever you want. She said, I, I cannot believe the shit is happening again. I cannot believe the shit is happening again. She said, but we're going. We're absolutely going. 
so we made our plans really, really early, and then I just, you know, did as what I could. I donated to the march. I, you know, we had to get um, Metro cards um, in advance because that was a crazy, crazy thing. Um, our friends who were putting us up and out in, in Chevy Chase were going to drive us to the Metro, but, you know, we, we got everything, and we packed everything, and Mom started knitting the pussy hat, so I can show you the pussy hat that she knit. So this she Love she it. knit she knit um, hats for me herself and my two sisters and she knit like three or four others and I sent them out I think I mailed some of them to people friends I knew who were going and so that's that's a plan is that Planned Parenthood yes sticker? and a Georgia together and a Georgia button. together button because I worked on Hillary's campaign I went okay. to the headquarters and worked on the campaign um, were your hats all the same all the same well actually no because they ran out of the they ran out of the the the, whatever the initial color was, I don't know if it was this color or another. So we each had a slightly different shade of pink. Yeah. Um, so so we, we had it all sorted out, like I said, within days or a week of the march being announced. It was done. So that, I got, I began to feel a little better. I, I began to feel more engaged. I was doing something. Even if, even if it was just, you know, walking around. <laughs> with who knows who would be there and if it would be a disaster. I was a little nervous, to be honest. And Mom and I, we talked about that. I, I, I said, you know, Mama, there could be problems. Um, you know, there's already, there have already been um, uh, violent acts against black churches and, um, you know, arson and vandalism. There, there are, people have already been um, harassed on the streets of Savannah by people claiming to, by, you know, I've, heard of African-American girls being harassed on the street by white men saying, you know, it's Trump's America now and you need to run. I mean, horrible, horrible, scary things. Um, and mom said, you know, I've thought about that. And she said, if I need to die for the cause, I'm ready to die for the cause. I'm okay with that. I'm really okay with that. I like your mother. Yeah. She's pretty, she's pretty rad. <laughs> so, so and, I, and I thought, you know, I, I am too because I, I feel that distraught. I, I feel that sad and disheartened for my country. And so an inaugural day came and we were flying that day. And not again, we weren't sure what it was going to be like flying into flying into DC, whether, you know, when we were coming into the airport. We had no idea how it was all going to go. So we we fly in, I think we leave in the morning on I think the march was on a Saturday, correct? Mm -hmm. So we flew in on Friday in the morning, but arrived sort of early afternoon. It was gray. Um, and I, I, I don't know how to describe it. Having lived in DC, having lived in Georgetown when we were in high school, there was a quality to DC that was different already. There was a, there was a kind of an on edgeness, but it also was just empty. I was there the same time as you. It was mm -hmm. bizarre. Mm -hmm. Because again, I was there during Reagan's inauguration. I went to the mall. And again, the mall wasn't terribly filled up, but Washington was kind of kind of a, a, a big, busy hub of a place during the Reagan years. And, it, you know, it was, you say a lot of things about Reagan, but it, it was a bustling town. And it had been a sleepy little southern town. I had been there in the months leading up to the election of Reagan and it had been sort of a sleepy town you know and boom it was bustling and that started leading up to the inauguration but I, I it felt like a bit of a ghost town when we landed in National Airport this time it was really really weird and so you know we are like this is just weird so we get off and we and we Mom had had a car arranged, so we get, we get into the car and we're driving around and I, and I, and I thought it was going to be really difficult because roadblocks and, you know, the inauguration was happening during that time and, I mean, it was right as the inauguration was happening and we just sailed around. I mean, yeah, there were certain roads we couldn't take, but we just sailed around on the GW and, and went, you know, kind of up high enough. Um, I, don't, I don't even think we got on the Beltway and just came around and went to Cherry Chase and it was fine and... It was really great, and we went to dinner that night, and we had a we'd had a reservation, and a friend was able to come and meet us, and she could drive from Alexandria, 
and the restaurant was filled with people. I don't think they were wearing pussy hats, but you could tell the energy was, people were really stoked. And it, yeah. maybe there were some people there for the inauguration, but our friend who works at the school we used to go to, which is a girl's school, um, said that, you know, all of her friends in D.C., no one she knew voted, voted for Trump. So that D.C. was pretty solidly, and I guess at 90% it went for Hillary. So it was, it, there was like a, an electric sense in that restaurant, which happened to be right next to the crazy pizza parlor that was shot up. Yeah. I for, what's the name of that pizza parlor? It's, a, it's, like the, it's like the intergalactic pizza parlor. It has a crazy name or something. The one that they thought that there were sex slaves in the basement. Mm -hmm. It was so crazy. So we actually walked through that place. Yeah, that pizza place. Anyway, it, it was so surreal. It was just surreal. And so we went to dinner, me and my two sisters and my mom and our friend Holland. It was great. And we were just talking about everything and, you know, what we'd heard so far and just the, you know, whatever, how excited we were for, for the next day. And then we go home, we go to bed, we wake up, and our friend Jim takes us down to the metro. So we get to the metro, and as you can imagine, it's crazy town. I don't remember what stop we went to, but I think they drove us out. I think it wasn't the Chevy Chase Metro. Okay. I think it was one farther out thinking that we'd have an easier time getting, you know, into the station. So we get there and because our, my mom was on a, was on a walker, uh, a rolling walker, they directed us to the, you know, the, um, the disabled access. And so we went in the elevator and me and my two sisters and we go down to the platform and there were DC cops. Uh, there were National Guard and maybe other troops everywhere, smiling, directing us. We all said thank you to them. They, they gave us thumbs up. Men, women, a, a, every race and everything were all super happy and very sweet. That was its own surreality. Um, we go down to the platform. I think it took us a couple of trains to get on, but we got on and we had to transfer because my mom had said that she found in her research that we had to go to, um, now I'm forgetting which stop, but we had to transfer at Metro Center or someplace to get to, to a particular stop that was best for disabled access. Okay. So we, we transfer wherever, we Metro Center, wherever we transferred and it was pandemonium except, again, directed by the cops and the National Guard. So, I mean, there were just crazy numbers of people. But as soon as they saw that my mom was on a walker, they, they, they gave us um, direction and got us in, into, but we had to wait, I don't know, three, four, maybe four trains to get on and, you know, get my mom in with her walker. But we did. And everywhere, I mean, everywhere from the time we first got on into that first station, I mean, just a sea of pussy hats on men, women, every age, on kids. There were people with multiple toddlers. There were people with babies and little baby Bjorns. It, there was every race. There was every gender, every sexual orientation. I mean, it was not, because when I had been to the women's marches before on the mall, it had been pretty white. Mm -hmm. That was not the case this time. It was so diverse. That was so heartening. Um, and again, every, I mean, there were very elderly people and there were tiny babies and everything in between. We just, from the moment we joined the crowd in that first station, I mean, the hairs on our arms and the back of our necks, this elation, this giddiness, this, this wave of euphoria came over us and we were just, people were singing songs and chanting and people made way for my mom. It, it was, it was, it was extraordinary. It really, really was extraordinary. People were so kind. They, they were gracious. We talked about everybody's, oh, how'd you, how'd you, did you buy your pussy hat or did you make it? And my mom said, oh, no, I'm going to knit them for all my girls. And my mom told everyone that she, the last time she'd been at a protest had been in 1963 at the Dr. King's March on Washington. People were wowed by that. 
So we finally get to whatever station we were. I don't even know what it was. And we get out and we just start into the crazy river of people. And it is a river of people. It is a river. And there was very little getting out of the river. So very quickly we discovered that we were a block or two off the mall. Uh, and we thought, we need to use the loo now or ain't going to happen. So we got in a line that ended up being, I think, an hour long for Portalettes before we could even go anywhere because we thought it's now or never. And we brought little bits of water and little snacks and we'd had a breakfast and so we were you know, trying to just very sparingly drink water. So we, but that was its own thing. People were laughing and telling jokes and where are you from and they were from everywhere. They, they were from, you know, Louisiana, and they were from Alaska, and they were from New York, and they, they were from literally all over the country. And that was its own joy, was just hearing people's stories, you know, along the way. And so, so we were waiting for the portal S. We finally, 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 an hour later, get into the portal S, and then we keep going. And then when we think we were maybe a half a block off the mall, that was it. We could not go anywhere. We were stuck in some weird little plaza between office buildings. I don't know where we were. Um, but we were just stuck. There was no going anywhere. There was no even trying to get on the mall. That's how I know that this, that there's, I mean, and I'll tell a story about how I know definitively that it was more, more than a million. But I said, guys, this is more than a million. Because when I've been on the mall before and we estimated 750,000, we could get on the mall. We can't even get on the mall. We can't get on it. So we were, you know, wondering like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And we could hear loudspeakers, but we couldn't really hear. We finally pushed our way enough up that we got into this little area that I don't, I don't know what it was. It just, there were buildings everywhere, but we could sort of see the mall a block or two away or half a block or a block away and then we were close enough that we could hear loudspeakers so we could hear what was happening and that's what everyone around us was doing there there was a woman who had um her she had gloves on and then stuck on her gloves were little tiny hands little tiny trump hands and every time there was a musician, she was dancing with her little tiny <laughs> trump hands. And we were just howling with laughter. And we were all singing and chanting and, you know, clapping. And whatever they told us to chant, we would chant. And we, we, we listened to, you know, Alicia Keys. And we listened to, um, you know, uh, various, you know, speakers from Black Lives Matter. And we listened to... And all around, I mean, we were we were sardines. I mean, we we were kippers in a can. You know, we could not move, but there was no fear. I'm terribly claustrophobic, and you know, I felt uncomfortable at times. But the the euphoria, it was this huge contact high, like I was on some crazy drug, like you get when you're in surgery drug. You know, and. It was just, we just kept looking around saying, this is just magical. You know, people with children, people would make way. At one point, there's a, a murmur passed up saying, somebody's down, somebody's down, somebody's down, somebody's down. Make way, make way, make way, make way. We need police, we need police, we need police, we need police. And people would just pass it down. And, and you know, the Red Sea parted and they made way. And the cops were able to pull a cruiser up, and we don't even know what happened to the person. Maybe they fainted. I don't know. Um, it just magically happened. There was no shoving. There was no arguing. There was no, you know, you know, I'm more committed than you, or, you know, my cause is better than yours. No, it was just, it was amazing. Speaking of causes, when you were looking around, what yeah. different causes were you seeing on like, the, a, a lot of Black Lives Matter, um, and and also there was a, a sign 
um, that looked like it was painted by the guy who had done the Ob famous Obama sign that was a woman in hijab. Um, so there was a lot of, uh, there were a lot of signs about, um, and there were a lot of hand, hand done signs about, you know, keep your, keep your hands, you know, keep your laws off my body and that kind of thing. But, um, there was a lot of stuff about Black Lives Matter and, um, you know, the, the horrors, the horrors of the, you know, excessive use of force and, uh, that have happened from time immemorial, but that we've seen through social media. So I saw a lot of signs about that. Um, I saw a lot of signs about the corruption that people were, you know, the nepotism and the corruption that we, people were protesting in the, in the Trump administration. Um, you know, I, I took photographs of some of the signs and I'll, I'll make sure to include those. You know, we would laugh. There were hilarious, there were hilarious signs that I'm not remembering right now, but we would just, we, there was so much laughter. We were just laughing and crying when we heard people's stories, you know, when they were talking about, you know, the coming over the loudspeakers about, you know, losing people or, or being raped or whatever. I mean, it was, it was, it was really a deeply emotional day, but it wasn't a sad day. It was a really, it was uplifting and it just, I felt that I was, you know, sort of hovering above, like having an, how to, having an out of body experience watching myself, yeah. you know, it, and at times where you try to climb up something so we could look out and see. And I mean, it, it was, it was an ocean. It was an ocean of people. I've never been in a crowd that big in my life and I've been in some really big crowds so that was really profound. And so it's at one point, Alicia Keys had played and then um, Janelle Monet had played. And I don't know where this falls in the, you know, the lineup. We had lost anything, you know, because we had lost all sense of time and place. And we were just floating on a sea of, you know, of female happiness. Uh, not that there weren't a lot of men there, because there were. But finally, things began to move a little bit and we began to move a little bit further in and then at one point we were like by the old Smithsonian castle I think um, and finally uh, there was a monitor and we could kind of see it in that and that was when I think Madonna was singing and talking and then we could finally get on the mall mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then the march but then by then like the mall was it wasn't a march at that point. It was just, there were just people. I can't explain it. It wasn't like a traditional march in that sense. There were just masses and masses of people. So it wasn't a march like, you know, from here to there. It was just a, we're here. We're just occupying this town. We, this, is, this is our town now. This is where we live. Um, and so, you know, we were marching up and down Constitution at that point, I guess. And, um, Bizarrely, we ran into someone we know. Mm -hmm. So my sister, someone we knew from way back in the Cincinnati days, whom my sister Eliza, who lives in Boulder, has come to get to know again in Boulder, a fellow mom at a they, they had ch children at the same school, and so we were we took pictures with her. My mom had known her mom because we'd actually bought her house oh in God. Cincinnati. So that was crazy, um, I, and. It was just, you know, people carrying little kids on their shoulders and chanting. And I think one of the things that really heartened me the most was the number of millennials who were there, who I know have been disengaged from the political process. They were the ones who were handing out signs from various, from now or from, you know, immigrant rights organizations. They were the ones leading the chants, coming through, giving us, you know, kind of fresh injections of energy. They were the ones, you know, handing out water or whatever. There were just tons of millennials because I was really worried about that. You know, I, I, like I said, you know, my mom's, I'm 74, I'm 53. I, there's a lot I can do, but there's a lot I can't do. And, you know, I can't go to every protest. I'm, I'm helping raise a family. You know, I, I've got commitments. Um, you know, I've always been involved in, in nonprofit work and, and on boards and raising money and, and you know, engaged in, in so many different ways. But I can't always be at the protests, although I have been to Planned Parenthood protests. But um, I, needed, I needed to see that. I needed to see that mass of humanity. I needed to see that I wasn't alone. I needed to see that the next generations are taking up the baton. And I saw that. And, 
we, I mean, all of us at various points, I saw my mom just weeping at one point and uh, I have this picture. She, it, this was not her, her, you know, slogan, but she just loved it. And so she got a sign and she flipped it over to the white side and she wrote, I can't believe I still have to protest this shit. <laughs> and she wore it while sitting on her walker and people would come up and take pictures with her like she was a celebrity. You know, they're just like, you're right. I can't believe it either, you know. And there were lots of women of her generation yes. there. But there were lots of millennials. And they were super stoked about seeing my mom and seeing all of us and, you know, knowing that, that the generations were there. And so it was, it was one of the most magical, beautiful, inspiring days of my life. I think yeah, my, yep. my wedding day. And you know, the day that I got into graduate school and, and the Women's March on Washington, I, I, you know, it was pretty damn magical. You said you, do you, you cried a couple of times? Oh my are, are there, were there moments that, that, that just like made you lose it? Yeah. I think there was a moment when we were packed in there, like, you know, sardines, um, and I, and I looked around and nobody was shoving, nobody was, you know, upset, uh, nobody was jockeying, um, everybody was content to just be stuck like sardines. And my mom at that point, I think, was sitting down on her walker. Sometimes she would stand and then sometimes she would sit down. That's part of the reason for having the walker. And I don't even know if anybody was talking about anything in particular on the loudspeaker. I, I think, I think I just had a sense of peace, maybe. Now, this is why we come. Mm -hmm. That my mom needed to see this, mm -hmm. and that the last time I was on the mall with my mom, in a other than just going to the museums. Um, I was in her belly, you know, and I think it just overwhelmed me. That's very significant. Yeah, I think it just, you know, that she's told me the story of, of being there with Dr. King and what it was like to be so pregnant and it was so hot and that they couldn't get very close to him, but they could hear and, and that there were you know, it was a peaceful gathering, obviously, that time, and there were people of all ages and all, and all, you know, races, and 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 that she felt that it was that everybody knew who was there at that march, that it was a huge deal, that it was a huge moment in history, and I felt that too. I I felt that women women need to know their power. They, they need to know that we, we have it. We just have to take the reins. We, we, we have to st stop acting like we're sitting behind some man on the horse. There's no man on the horse. We're riding. We have the reins. And, and the horse is a western horse and knows how to neck rein, so it's not even that hard. You don't have to yank. You just have to lay the reins gently on the neck and it'll turn one way or lay them on the neck and the not that we don't have to fight but our fight is different we are different kinds of fighters as women and not that we can't be fierce warriors in battle we totally can but even if it's just culturally we approach things differently and at some point i don't know who who among us whether it was one of my sisters or my mom or me but somebody said this is what it would be like if we actually ran the world. So, I I feel like we all collectively got a got a vision that day that we got a vision of how it could actually be, and that there won't be issues and problems having to do with intersectionality and all that shit. I know that, but there were no fucking problems that day. There were there's no vandalism. There were no shootings, no stabbings. There wasn't even any shoving. There was there was no ego. Did you see any um, like opponents, any protesters, kind of? Protesters? Yes, that's a good point. We did. We saw 
pro-life, such as they are, and I hate that term, it's really anti-woman, um, protesters, and they were all sort of in one area, and um, they were holding up signs that said, you know, abortion is murder, all that, all that typical crap. But they were being respectful. They were, from, from my vantage point, they were sort of across a little plaza in the sea of people. I couldn't really hear what they were saying, but they were, they had huge signs. Um, I, I didn't get the sense that they were shoving signs in people's faces or, or pushing or shoving or doing anything bad. I think they wanted a presence and that's okay. That's their right. At, a, at the Planned Parenthood protest here a few weeks after that, I, um, we went, it was a, it was a counter protest. And so we, we went, basically we're meant to be silent and not to engage them. And it was the same. They were across the street. They didn't yell at us. We didn't yell at them. They had a right to be there. We had a right to be there. They were respectful. They, they didn't even really glare. They were just there holding their signs. And that's, that's the way it should be. That's, you know, peaceful protest is a, a right and an honorable tradition in this country. And, and we, we all have a right to that. And we all have a right to our beliefs. So it was, um, I, I, it's hard to tell how many there were of them. I want to say there were a dozen signs. So maybe there were, you know, 20 of them or something. And some, sometimes there were a lot of drums. And I assumed that that was for the women's march. But it could have been partly them too. I don't, I couldn't see. You know, we were just stuck. <laughs> we couldn't see anything. Um, and, and for a while we, could, we couldn't hear. But then again, we, could, we got where we could hear the speakers. But uh, there were... But they weren't, it just felt like they were irrelevant that day. Yeah. You know, they, they were there, it was noted, but we had bigger fish to fry. We had a republic to save. <laughs> so, you know, we're a little busy. <laughs> and you, I mean, you're absolutely right. It was very, very, very peaceful pro protest. And you talked about seeing uh, police officers at the metro and all that. Did you see much of that along, along the route? Everywhere. They were everywhere. And they were beaming. We would go up to... We made a point, my mom and my sisters and I, of going up to them and saying, thank you for your service. And they said, absolutely. Wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Thumbs up. Women, men, everybody. All of them. They were efficient. They were kind. They, they worked hard, they were vigilant, but not mean, um, they were not cold. I mean, I've been in protests where they are stone-faced and, and uh, intimidating. No, it, it didn't feel that there was a gulf between us and them. It felt that they were cheering us on, mm -hmm. that, that they were really on our, on our side. And I don't mean that even politically, I just mean in a human way. They were really excited to see how beautiful. This is such a beautiful protest. It was so beautiful. It was a sea, a sea of pink pussy hats. And that's a quite, I wanted to come back. It's the perfect timing to talk about. Let's talk about the pink pussy hats. Um, you obviously, you had one, your, your, all your family had them. Um, what did you think about the concept of the pussy hat and, and how it played out on the day? Because there were some some complaints about you know it being frivolous or being rude or whatever. I think, but I being mean, there, right. seeing that. Yeah. Uh, well, talk I've about heard Julie you Mason uh, uh, of the press pool, whom I really love on on CRSXM, said that she thought it was frivolous, and I absolutely disagree. Number one, it gave us cohesion. What no matter our our size, our gender, you know, our sexual orientation, our race, anything. That sea of pink pussy hats gave us unity, visually. And look, I'm the daughter of a designer. You know, what she, what the, the thing that she says that most people don't do with design properly is they don't edit properly. There's too much happening. That cut down the visual pollution. It was really so powerful visually. And look, my mom knows her stuff. She's designed buildings, she's designed clothing, she's designed interior, she's designed, you know, textile, she's designed everything. And she was right. 
she said she and she was insistent that she knit as many as she possibly could and I absolutely disagree with that concept that, that, that it was silliness or or frivolous or you know um it, no we are powerful our bodies are powerful and you know the insides of our bodies are pink so <laughs> there you go you know so suck it people because it looked amazing and it, it, it was really, you know, when you saw somebody out with, with one, you know, you knew right away that's a kindred spirit. And you knew that that was somebody who, who was really excited, excited to be there. And people were pink in other ways, too. If they couldn't, couldn't get a pussy hat or couldn't knit one or couldn't find one or didn't matter, you know, just want to do something different. So many people wore pink. And pink is a really powerful, I mean, you know, the Nazis used to, to identify gay men and women and and I love the way that it's been appropriated um I love you know I love I love the statement that it gave and I think it was powerful politically and I think it was powerful visually and aesthetically and I think it it made us it, it gave us that cohesion and and that that unity that we desperately needed that I was afraid of when I went to, to the march, not knowing A, how big it would be, or B, kind of comparing it to previous marches. It it had nothing to do with any other march I ever went to. It, it was its own animal. It was its own big, beautiful pink animal. And uh, I, it, it was magic from from the time that we started planning it, and, and the high lasted for weeks afterwards, and, and maybe even months. I mean, it just, I needed that. It was a shot in the arm. Oh, yeah. And the pussy hats were a huge part of that. So kudos to um, the adorable women who created it. And I've, se I've seen they send me emails now and again. I, I, I think it was a brilliant a stroke of marketing genius. Well, there's also this, this idea that women create using textiles. Using the, It was such a woman-created yes. idea. And we're sharing doing that knitting Traditional circles. things that, we, that yes. we would do as women. So there's, the, there's that added Absolutely. Piece of it as well. that it's That they're handmade, mm -hmm. you know, and... And, um, and, and exactly, my mom is a huge proponent of, of um, the needlework arts and, and has always, you know, sh gone out of her way when we go to museums to focus, to bring us girls to focus on that. And, and my mom is also just a brilliant needle pointer and cross stitcher and Bargello person and she can do, you know, cruel work. She can do anything. But um, she said, you know, these are, this is, women were not allowed to make art. Women were not allowed to have agency. Women are not, and so a this was a way for them to channel their creativity into something, and b it was a way for them to gather together without looking suspicious. A lot of the abolitionist stuff happened over knitting circles and, and needlework, and you know, and and quilting in the African American community was was a language of its own, a part of part of the Underground Railroad. All of that she has drummed into me since I was a little girl. So yeah, I don't what did I. It's a profound misunderstanding of um, of the intent and and the way it played out to say that it did that it, it it belittled the march or it's ridiculous. No, it was so powerful. It was incredible. It's not pink in the way that people wear you know pink breast cancer stuff, which I think is a ridiculous corporate corporate marketing ploy. No, it had nothing to do with that. Nothing at all. And you could never ever pretend that that wasn't a women's march. <laughs> I'm, the visual is there. It's it was like, there. It's pink. It's a sea of pink. Yeah. There's, you you couldn't pretend that and was the inauguration. And it was all over the world. It was in Antarctica. It was in Jordan. I mean... So let's talk about that because, like, well, I, we'll get to that in a second. First, let's get you to the end of the, the day and get, get yeah. you, you, you home. So we, you know, we made our way up to, uh, as we're, you know, kind of, off, off of Constitution and onto, I guess, the backside of the of the White House, and um, I don't know what they call that part. If that's that's not really the maybe it's considered the lawn, even though it's outside the gates. But anyway, this is big, expansive green, and there was this big makeshift fence that um, I guess was because they had been doing construction, or I don't even know why it was there, but it was sort of blown down or whatever. And we'd had all of our signs, and we'd all had doctored them and done our things to them. And my mom had written that I can't believe I'm still protesting this shit sign. And women had been leaving them there. 
And so we left ours there and I started weeping again because it was just so beautiful. You know, all of these handmade signs with these streamers and, and these pictures and, and, uh, and, and people just left them as a testament and people were photographing that. You know, that became part of the art. I mean, kind of like what Christo does, everything was part of the art. Yeah. You know, Christo says, the check I get for my art is part of my art. You know, leaving the sign there was part of the art and people taking pictures of that was part of the art and me crying over it was part of the art. It was all part of the art. It was a happening like they had in the 60s. It was a happening. And that was so, you know, the chanting and the, and the, and the winks between people. And at that point, you know, we were, we were just spent emotionally. We've been up since, gosh, we got up at six. We got on the Metro at eight. Uh, we got uh, to the first, you know, got out of the Metro at nine. Uh, we were in the portalette <laughs> line for an hour. That was 10, 1030. When we were able to inch our way around and then got to that place, wherever the hell we were, I don't know, that, that we could hear the loudspeakers, and that was probably 11. And we were there for like two hours, so that was one. And so again, by the time we actually got on the mall, it was the tail end of the whatever. There were hundreds of thousands of people, but it wasn't a march at that point. It was just a, people were just wandering. Um, and we did join on Constitution. There was a the march. I mean, you know, there were people behind us too who hadn't been able to get on. So at that point it was three, maybe, it's beginning to get all dark. And we made our way up um, kind of west of the, of the White House. So we're coming up to Pennsylvania Avenue at that point. And we found a McDonald's and we were able to go in and get a little warmed up and sit down. And at that point, my sisters and I made the decision that we were going to get an Uber for my mom. Uh, that we didn't think that she could deal with a Metro again. So as expensive as it was, <laughs> it was about a hundred bucks. Uh, but for the four of us, yeah. you know, it wasn't so terrible. Um, and so we, you know, that, that took us about a half an hour to kind of make that judgment. We got some coffee or some tea or whatever, and we were hanging out. And then we thought, okay, we're, I think we're done. I think we're done. We've done what we came to do, and it was awesome, and, um, and we needed to get my mom off her feet. And also we had, our friends were making us dinner. The men were making us dinner, which was so perfect. <laughs> so, uh, making us a steak dinner. So, we got an Uber, and uh, it was a big SUV Uber, and we, we went back, and we were all just, we just kept looking at, we, we had almost nothing to say to each other. We were just sort of beaming. We, we, we cried every tear. We laughed every laugh. Um, we felt like we, we, we performed our mitzvah, and we were done. And so we went back up to Jim's house, and Jim is a really interesting person in his own right. He's an author and a State Department person, and he has his own take on what's happening with our government. Um, and uh, so he and his son and his daughter-in-law uh, were making us this fabulous steak dinner in his wonderful house. So he, ma he makes um, sh sh model ships and, and, and has model like bat battles and things. And so, you know, we were kind of wandering around his house and looking at all these things and the things that his late wife had collected. And his, my mom and she had been best friends. So um, that was really neat. And then his granddaughters came over and they were just little pistols, super cool little, little chicks. Um, and so we were hanging out with them and playing cards with them and ate dinner. And it was just, it was really... Perfect end to your day. It was perfect. Yeah, and our friend that my sister and I had gone to the girls' school in, in Virginia when we lived in D.C. came over again because she'd, she'd been with us the night before she came over again, and that was really fun because, you know, we went to this fabulous girls' school that was founded by this woman who founded as an alternative to boys' schools, not as a finishing school, but as an alternative to Exeter and Andover, and she was a real feminist and a contemporary of Maria Montessori and a friend of hers. Anyway, very cool. So it was just, it was sort of like... <laughs> We were just on, we were on cloud nine, it was fabulous. You know, we were really, really high and happy. And, and then we woke up, crack it on, next day, 
got in an Uber and went to the airport and we're done. Were there, and, and I wanted to talk about your return flight, but also maybe think back to your flight up from Savannah. Where did you recognize, did you recognize that there were other women marchers? Yes. Yes. How, what, was, what was the mood like when, when you were so, flying? So, um, coming up, um, I think there were, there were a couple of people, they weren't wearing their pussy hats, but you could see they were, they were holding them and kind of putting them in backpacks and things. And there was just, the, and the flights from, from Savannah to National are small planes. Yes. Okay. So, you know, there was a kind of a fun energy going up. Um, and like I said, I mean, anybody who'd gone for the inauguration had already gone. Interestingly, when we first got to the Savannah airport when we were leaving um, to go up there, the people at the counter said, are you going to the inauguration? And my mom said, nope. <laughs> they didn't have, uh, ask a follow-up, and we didn't offer. But mom said, nope, that's not why we're going. <laughs> um, and like I said, it was ghost town when we got there. On the way back, um, we, uh, both flights we had to, when we, when we were in Nashville, we had to take a shuttle, you know, we kind of were let off on the tarmac and had to take a little shuttle bus to the terminal. So on the way back home, you know, we had to go and get in the, get in the bus. And there were some, there were some people on the way back who were clearly inauguration people. Um, they were not, you know, mean or anything, but they were military looking white men um, who were talking about, I, it was hard to tell they were, but, but then some other women came onto the bus and we started excitedly talking to them and we got a lot of glares from the men. We got a lot of glares and eye rolling, but it was really, we didn't care, <laughs> give a shit. We were just, we were really, really, really happy. And, um, it was fun. It was fun kibitzing with them. So yeah, there was definitely a sense of camaraderie with, with everyone you would run into, you know, on the way there, on the way back, when you were wandering around town. Um, so it was, yeah, it was pretty magical. So you get back home, uh, at what point, and maybe this is, be I'm sure probably before you even got home, you realize this was so much bigger than anyone. I mean, I know you, being in DC, you knew that. Oh, I knew. But the fact that yeah. it was worldwide, yeah. Where, you know, how did you um, feel when you, you were sort of figuring that out? I got back and I think, you know, kissed my husband and had a glass of wine <laughs> and began to watch, began to watch the news and the kids were upstairs because it was, um, by that point it was late, maybe late afternoon on a Sunday and they were working on their homework. So I was just sitting with my husband and he began to tell me about Jack's, my stepdaughter, um, being glued to the coverage and I said, you know, so so that that really because She's very attuned as a, as a teenager to what's popular and what's trending and you know That's even though she's a very quiet shy Person she's a teenager. She's kind of interested in what the kids are talking about, you know around the world um, And so he said he said no she was she was glued to the television while you were gone. She was glued and wanted to understand what was happening and what this meant and who was there and you know why was this happening and who was speaking. Um, and he said, "I know she's going to want to debrief with you when you and you have a chance." And so that was like, "Wow, okay. Well, how many people were there?" And he said, "Well, they're estimating. Um, what did they estimate?" There's a wide estimate, from yeah, like, like eight hundred thousand to a half, one and a half million. Right, so. right. I think they like eight eight hundred thousand was was at that point what they were saying, and I was like, oh yeah, it's and it's more. I knew that it was more than that. I mean, again, we couldn't even get on the mall until the march had sort of was halfway done. Um, so I, I was I was wowed, and I began to look through social media at things that were happening in other countries and, you know, seeing them in, in my beloved Italy, um, in Milan and in Rome and, um, and of course in the UK and in Ireland and, and, but when I began to see that they were in, in places that the Maldives, you know, and in Jordan in places where women are not necessarily, um, you know, <laughs> encouraged to stand up for themselves or or to have autonomy and agency that really blew me away and then the Antarctica one I just thought was just 
they were cutest buttons on that on that crazy mm -hmm. boat or whatever mm -hmm. they were. I don't even know where they were. But I I I, I thought, okay, uh, not only am I not alone, and not only did more than half my country vote like I did. Um, you know, so we'll, we'll, we'll sort this out. It may, I don't know how much time it's going to take and I don't know how much damage is going to be done, but we will sort this out. But not only that, but now the world knows that Americans are not on board with this. And I needed, I, as a, as a person who's lived abroad, who speaks other languages, who's traveled extensively, again, I'm a profoundly American person, but I love the world, you know, I want to visit the world. I'm interested in the world and, and I, I hate the fact that the world looks at us and thinks, you know, we've lost our damn minds. Mm -hmm. So that was really uh, reassuring. It was really reassuring to know that, that, that the, the cause had been taken up all over the world. And a few weeks later, we had this action at Planned Parenthood here that that um, was not pl planned by Planned Parenthood, but it would, there was an um, there was a defund Planned Parenthood march, and so or protest, and so we were asked to respond to that by staying on property, by not engaging and not talking to them, or you know crossing the street or anything. We were just supposed to be quiet and walk around with signs and our pussy hats and all that. Well, I ran into friends there, one of whom. Uh, was had been in Washington. We talked to it, and I said, you know, I, I don't, I don't buy the half a million or seven hundred fifty thousand or eight hundred. I don't buy that. I've been on protests. It, it's bigger. And he said, oh, it was bigger. And I said, well, this is my friend Dan. And, and I said, how do you know that? He said, because I have a friend who works at the Department of Defense, and the National Park Service used to be tasked with estimating the size of crowds. But they got out of it because it was too political and they didn't want to be involved in it anymore. Understandable. Well, DOD has to. Homeland Security, ha they have to know because they have to be prepared for riots or terrorist attacks or natural disasters or whatever. Um, they have to have some kind of gauge of how many people were there. And I said, he said, my friend at DOD has seen the docs of the estimates. I said, how much? He said, 1.3 million to 1.7 million. I said, oh, Dan, it was every bit 1.3. It was. Yeah. I, I've been to two other protests that were, you know, probably like half a million to 750,000. This was not. <laughs> you couldn't even get there. We were sandwiched in there. And they, they were not because there were bottlenecks, it's because there was no place to go. So I, I feel strongly that it will be the biggest protest in American history, certainly up to this point and for many years to come. But I hope that there are others. I hope that others, that other, pro and I'm glad, I'm glad that there was already a, you know, a climate science protest and a, and a, what else? There have been a couple of There's the travel ban one. We, right. We, we had one in Atlanta. There's, right. Um, and those were all over. The airport tax something. march. The tax march, yeah. Um, I'm glad that things are really happening. And again, I've already been involved in, uh, I was involved in a Black Lives Matter march last summer. So that was before the election. But, um, you know, happily go to another one. I, it, we just have to keep doing everything. We have to write letters. We have to make phone calls. We have to march. We have to engage on social media. We have to talk to our family and friends. We have to give money. We have to vote. We have to register people to vote. We have to write. We have to do art installations. We, it doesn't, we have to sing. It doesn't matter. We just have to do whatever we can because th this isn't just bad for women. This is bad f for men. This is bad for children. This is bad for our very democracy. This is a threat to our republic. People across the political spectrum recognize it for what it is. This is... I don't want to talk about that. Um, like Since, you know, where we are now... How are we doing for time? Doing, I'm it's, sorry. it's two o'clock. Okay. Um, we are a few months out since the inauguration. Um, 
talk about how you've been feeling about what's actually transpired. Um, it's a shit show. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, it's a clown car. It's a farce. Um, but it's more than that. It, it, it you know, th this latest revelation that, that Donald Trump Jr. has just tweeted out his mea culpa, um, it is utterly bizarre, but it's a testament to the brazenness mm -hmm. of, uh, uh, of this crowd of people who do not respect our democracy or the republic and, and our norms and are blasting through them as, as though they had dynamite and, and, and they were blasting through, you know, a coal mine, which of course they would love to do. Um, I'm a writer, and so, you know, I've read Orwell, and I've read Huxley, and I've read Asimov and Bradbury, and I've read Margaret Atwood, <laughs> and I've read um, very widely in speculative and, and science fiction. Um, I've also read The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich and William Shirer's book. I'm encouraging everyone I know to read that and to read The Handmaid's Tale. Um, I'm not just afraid for uh, the right to choose. I, I'm not just afraid for um, black boys who are getting shot by the cops. I'm not just afraid for, you know, um, people who are going to lose health care. I'm literally afraid for my government. I'm terrified. Nothing that has happened has reassured me, except that, as Brian Williams said on the news, we have a good old-fashioned newspaper war going on. People are subscribing like they haven't in years or decades to, to the Times and the Post and the Wall Street Journal and the LA Times and the Chicago Sun, Chicago Tribune or whatever. And, uh, you know, I'm encouraged that journalism seems to be in its sort of, you know, its second golden age because Thank God for the journalists digging up this shit. Um, I'm encouraged that there are a lot of protests. I'm encouraged that we have some people in elected office who are standing up to this. Although, by no means all. By no means all Democrats. But we are really in a lot of danger. This is a really dangerous, terribly dangerous moment in American history. I cannot believe I'm living through it, and I don't know what to tell my children. I think that, <clears throat> I don't have children, but I think that must be <coughs> a very, um, you have to be so careful, you don't want to make them fearful, I know. but you want them to be good citizens. Right. And engaged. And engaged. It's like, just finding the right the right sort of path to take with them yeah. to make sure that they're well informed but not going to bed with nightmares is yeah. is like I I worry about parents and, and and I also admire parents who are taking this on and dealing with it yeah um, I've told them that I was a child a little younger than they are when Watergate happened and that I had a connection to it um, tenuous but um, we're living in Puerto Rico and um, lots of people came through the resort. My stepfather was running a resort in Puerto Rico. And um, so we, we had movie stars. And, you know, everybody came. Yeah. It's a resort. People come through. So at one point in 73, um, this nice family came to stay. And it was a mom and a dad and three boys around, right around the ages of our three girls. And I was just kind of like, being interested in, I was just, you know, I was like 11, I was like, hmm, boys maybe. And they were gorgeous, blonde haired boys. I had big crushes on them and we were playing with them and doing fun things with them. And at one point while they were there, I got the flu or a bad cold or something and I couldn't play anymore. And I was really distraught about that. Um, and before they left, they came in and poked their heads in and said, Catherine, we're so sorry that you couldn't play, but we're leaving tomorrow. We just want to say goodbye. And that was really sweet. 
So they left, and um, I'd say probably this is, that was like maybe the, um, maybe the fall of 73? I don't remember where it all fell, but they left, and um, uh, their name was Magruder. And a few months later, we were watching the news, and, you know, I was a little kid, I was interested in the news, but, I, you know, Walter Cronkite would come on, and, you know, my parents would have their cocktail and be watching, and the name Jeb Magruder came up, and I came up to my stepdad, and I said, Jeb Magruder, he looks a lot like the father of the Magruder boys, and he said, that is the father of the Magruder boys, and I said, well, why is he on the news? He said, well, because he's in trouble, and I said, well, why is he in trouble? And he said, well, because he works for President Nixon, and Nixon's in trouble. So, it, you know, it was yeah. real people. It wasn't just people mm -hmm. on the television screen. It was actual people, people I thought were nice people, who were in trouble and going to suffer mm -hmm. for, for what was happening in the news. And I didn't really understand it, but I knew that the president had lied. At least my parents said that he had, and he'd done something bad, and he, you know, there was some kind of break in. I didn't really understand. But I was huge, and then we even went to the White House for a tour sometime during Watergate, crazily enough. Um, just a standard, you know, tour. Nothing fancy or anything. We weren't meeting anybody fancy. Um, but we took it, you know, we went to Washington as a family trip, and so I said, you know, Watergate was was really alive for me as a child and I said you guys should pay attention because you're living through history this is really really a big deal um, not just the Russia thing but this presidency it is is not normal and y'all need to be aware of that um, because we're not always going to be around to fight this you know you guys are going to have to fight this um, just to just to hold the line <laughs> sometimes. So I've said things to them like that. I've told them that I'm scared for our country and that I'm scared for them um, because I, I don't, this is a very unpredictable group of people and they they pride themselves on that. You know, they, they pride themselves on, on being very, very unpredictable people. <laughs> so um, so I, I, I'm, you know, I've tried to impart it in that way, but I don't go on ad nauseum and I don't force them to watch the news. But, you know, they are asking questions. Drew, the, our, our son, is, is definitely asking more questions. Well, you know, I'm glad you're answering, honestly. Trying. Yes, you, what you have to do. Trying to. We have um, 2018, we have midterms. So let's, let's think about looking forward to 2018, the end of 2018. What what do you hope might happen? Like, let's look at it from a positive perspective. What do you hope might happen before then? Um, I do hope that the 53% of white women who voted for Trump wake up um, and realize that if they voted for their pocketbooks, they made a terrible mistake because health care alone is going to bankrupt so many people. And it's also going to force a lot of women to be caregivers who maybe otherwise wouldn't have had to. Because it's mostly women who are caregivers for elderly family members or sick children. Or, okay. um, I hope that we can register as many people of color as possible because I think there's a huge gap there. Um, and there's also a lot of voter suppression which is really horrifying. And again, Orwellian. Um, I hope, I hope that the, the, the beauty and the joy and the, that euphoria of the Women's March, I hope we can find a way to inject it into the process of engaging voters, registering voters, getting out the vote, inspiring them. I hope that, you know, I think if Hillary Clinton made a mistake, it's that she failed to do that somehow. And that's a shame. And 
I, do, I don't blame her for, for it, certainly. Uh, there's the misogyny and the, the fear-mongering on the right were pretty profound, and now we know, obviously, mm -hmm. all the crazy bots and the fake news and all that jazz that was going on. But I hope that we, as a people, and I hope that candidates, and I hope that the Democratic Party finds a way to impart that that joy and that happiness and that euphoria and that that sense of you know the world could be a different way we could actually we could go a different route we don't we don't have to be at each other's throats and blaming each other for problems and you know slicing up a smaller and smaller pie we don't have to do that actually there is actually plenty to go oh, yeah figure out ways to share it and to inspire people to share it. So that's what I hope. I, that, that was the takeaway for me from that march. That march it was like the, the best day of climbing trees as a kid. That was the feeling of climbing trees and playing with dolls and 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 uh, and playing spy, which we used to play, or you know that that sense of that impish sense of fun and possibility and and joy, and that everybody everybody's in the game, mm -hmm. nobody's left out. Everybody's in the game. We're all playing. Mm -hmm. Nobody has to be left out. It, it, it's it's unnecessary. It's not only immoral and wrong and mean-spirited and evil. It's just, it's absolutely unnecessary. We don't have to do that. We can all play together. We can do it. It's not, doesn't mean it won't be messy and we won't be arguing over the rules sometimes and, and that sometimes people, you know, take a hiatus and go play a different game. Fine. But there is plenty to go around. There's plenty of money. There's plenty of education. There's plenty of health care. There's plenty of housing. There's plenty of respect. And there's plenty of joy. There's just plenty. And I think we forget about that in the Democratic Party when we carve people up into their various factions. That what is the feeling we're going for? You know, this is the feeling we're going for. It's pretty fun <laughs> and goofy yeah. and silly and ridiculous and lovely and beautiful and magical and womanly and motherly and sisterly and fatherly and brotherly and it's, it's all there. That's It's all right there. We found it, so we just have to hold on to that feeling and inject that into our campaign slogans and our you know brochures and our talking points and how we do that, you know, was you know going to be hard, but we can do it. I do believe that we can. How, but let's talk about that because there's a long way to go. How yep. do we? How do we? You know, we continue to write to our, our representatives. We march. We protest. We call. We do all of that. How do we keep that momentum going and not get burned out? I think playfulness and art. So during the CPAC convention, the Conservative Political Action Convention that happened right after the election. Um, I believe it was right after the election. Maybe I'm mistaking that, but f funny, <laughs> Re activists with a really good sense of humor bought a ton of little Russian flags and passed them out and got all of them, all of them to wave it. That's what I'm talking about. It's funny. It's silly. It's it's um playfulness. It doesn't all have to be dour, you know, um, 19th century era, um, you know, abolitionists and suffragist rhetoric, which is yeah, very dour. Though I'm actually writing that there were there were plenty of plenty of actors who weren't who weren't like that, but. I think we can't always approach it like we know everything. It has to be a, it has to be aspirational and inspirational. Macron did this in France, and he's not even a hard leftist, but he figured out a way to pull people away from Marine Le Pen. That's extraordinary. When they are angry 
body and they are hurting and they are frustrated and they are being blown up by ISIS. Yeah. He said, uh, what, what is his slogan in French? Uh, en marche? Uh, forward, basically? Yeah. Um, goodness. Um, I think that's the kind of thing that we lecturing and hectoring and eat your vegetables doesn't work now because people are really suffering not just the white working class the black working class and the hispanic working class and the gay working class and the women working class you know there are lots of hurting people out there and they don't need fucking lectures yeah. they need inspiration and obama figured that out and unfortunately hillary couldn't quite yeah. swing that mm -hmm. but i think the next woman to run will be able to sort that out you know i don't know who she'll be if it'll be elizabeth warren or whoever but so i'm probably gonna have to leave pretty soon because i've that's, got yeah that's, that, that, this is great is there anything i want to ask one very quick yeah. question what was on your sign and what was your favorite chant oh god um i didn't make a sign because i was flying that's fine so um i think I think I wrote something on a sign. I just I literally can't remember what I wrote. Um, again, it was it was a day beyond words for me. I'm a writer, and I and I, I it was it was it was beyond words. It was beyond language. Language did, did not capture what I felt. Um, and the best slogan was really that that wasn't a slogan. It was this wonderfully creative woman with these crazy <laughs> gloves with the tiny hands and she wasn't she wasn't making them into a fuck you she was dancing she was just dancing with her tiny hands she was just dancing and that was the that was the spirit of the day for me yeah it was just you know we have to laugh we have to commune we have to find a way through this and to the other side and if we cannot laugh and we cannot cry and we cannot you know emote our way through this then we are sunk so yeah I mean I I, I there were so many amazing signs but I, they were all amazing there was no one that I thought was the best of all of the whole day it just Everyone was like, yep, there's a piece of it, there's a piece of it. It's the mosaic idea, right? I mean, you need every tessera, every tile to make it look right, you know? And it, but everyone would just, my heart would just sort of fill and fill and it would burst and then it would fill up again and it would burst. It was just, it was overpowering how emotional it was. I have one final question. If anyone out there is thinking about going to a march anytime in the months coming, what do you, what's your piece of advice? Oh my God, go. If you, if you feel paralyzed, if, if you feel powerless, if you feel rejected by the culture at large or by the current state of politics, or dejected by what you hear is going on with the EPA or um, De Department of Health and Human Services or anything, Department of the Interior, if you, or even on a local level, and, and, you, and you feel that your voice is not heard, marching and protesting peacefully, it gives you your voice back. And your, your voice is what you got. That's all, that's all you got. You know, you can build from that. But if you don't start with that, you, 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 you can be in danger of spiraling into self-destruction. And I worry about that. I worry about that, especially with our young people. And I don't want that to happen. I want them to see that. It's, this country is worth fighting for. Our bodies are worth fighting for. This, in, this globe of ours that we all share is worth fighting for. That we're not going down without a fight. And you, you gotta, you've got to add your voice. It can be scary. I was scared. I was scared. I've been scared every protest I've ever been to. 
You don't know how people will react. You know, we have a lot of guns in this country. It's really terrifying. You know, but I'm not going to let it stop me. You know, I, I, I can't. My, you know, my parents fought for this stuff. My grandparents in their own way did. My grandfather fought in World War II. You know, my... I've had, I've had ancestors fight in, in every war ex except Vietnam. You know, so... I, I can't walk away from this fight. And, you know, that this is my fight. It's everybody's fight. And I, ha I, had, to, I had to walk and I had to give my voice. So I'm really proud of, of having done so, but it was only a start. I mean, you know, that was then and then. This is now, and I'm keeping going. But yeah, you just don't don't hesitate. It was also lots and lots of fun. <laughs> lots and lots of fun. So yeah, do it. Well, I am so thankful that you took time to come and talk about your experiences yeah. today. This yeah. has been great. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Yeah. Morning, it was wonderful.